So this is a thin jam, and uh, I've conducted a couple of these thin jams to sort of start to sort of start this cascade of your brain on your brain in music. So okay. So how many of you just uh, off the top of my head? How many of you are dancers? Have learned some kind of music or sing? You will play the violin. Very nice. Tansens. Okay, good amount of tansens. Tansens. Love to listen. Music is your favorite drug. Your chronic drug abusers. <laughs> all of all of you. Hey, a musical haters. Does music interfere with your? Certain types of music. Yes. Okay. See. Okay. Are there any a musical people who just love poetry? Nice. In an experiment, it should always have a negative control, right? Yeah. <laughs> so there, there you go. I have my negative control. Okay. So I am going to be sort of facilitating a journey into how your brain works and perceives and consumes music, and we're going to do it through a combination of some singing, some guided listening, and if you are adventurous, I can get you to sing a little bit and uh, the idea behind this thing jam is that there are only two rules one is you have to speak up i'm not going to be the only one speaking up second rule is that this must be a lot of informal fun <coughs> so are you all game yes all right uh, now i'll begin with disclaimer i'm a vintage bollywood Music fan, so some of this content can be like from the era of Shamshad Begum and Lata Mangeshkar and Asha Bhosle. How many of you listen to that stuff? Oh, not bad. So I'm not completely placing my content. This is targeted content, demographic specific, sensitive content. Okay, good. So close your eyes, humor me, and then just listen. Sari gari gari gapa, gapa da pa, gapa da pa da sa, da sa ri sa. Sari gari gari gapa, gapa da pa da pa, gapa da pa da sa. Sari gari gari gapa, gapa da pa, gapa da pa da sa, da sa ri sa. Okay. Now, how many of you felt this was a happy melody? Good. You've all taken the bait. <laughs> How many of you felt this is a sad melody? Uh -uh. How many of you listen to Bhupen Hazar? Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. One. Okay. How many of you felt nothing? Huh. It's always that one person. Why did you feel nothing? I could relate to it. How many of you felt this is a Chinese melody from a long time, long time? Sayonara, sayonara, father ni bhangi, sayonara. Sari gari ga ba ga ba da ba da sa, sayonara, sayonara. Right? How many of you felt very Chinese elements? Chome? Feel some chome? Yeah, you did? Okay. Why did you feel Chinese? Huh. Um, I, like there was this one Chinese instrument, I don't know the name, but it was five years. Yeah. Like a, like a pentatonic scale. Right. Most of Chinese melodies are, are on this uh, on this other pentatonic scale. 
Sayonara also, that song as well. So, how many of you felt that? How many of you just listened to the swaras for thinking of God, which Raga? <laughs> yeah. What did you post? What was the first attack on the song? Which Raga? You learn music? Great. Five notes, six notes. All that thinking, right? So he, right here, we saw a sampling of the various ways in which people decode music, right? Some people are like, well, whatever, I don't like her voice, maybe, right? She opens her throat a little too much. Ah, shrieky voice, things like that. You are just responding to it at the level of sound and timbre. Some of you felt nothing. Some of you related that to a Chinese instrument that you heard. And some of you started concrete thinking about it. Wanted to understand it semantically, right? Syntax, semantics. How many notes? Five notes, six, six notes, seven notes, four notes, three notes. What the hell is going on? And these weird phrases that she's singing. And then some of, some of you only thought emotion. Happy, sad, melody, things like that. So this is just an estimation for a, a, a quick pop quiz to just give you the diversity of ways in which people attack sound. <coughs> there is no one size fits all. It's not like everybody is listening to it and thinking, ha, to to hai. Ha, hai. <laughs> <laughs> Never happens. People are sitting there and thinking, oh yeah, this is Sayonara type of sounding uh, melody, isn't it? And this is not, making me feel X, Y, and Z or not making me feel things. And okay, so there's a great diversity of approaches through which people decode music. And that explains, yes. Uh, I just wanted to point out one more thing. I think in the previous, I noticed that you were counting the beats with your feet. So that is something I... Smarty pants. Okay. What is that? Say that again. I can So the this. second version, when I sang, I did staccato and then I did this. That thing, right? Yeah. How did that make you feel since you observed it? Um, in general, the melody made me feel happy, but I got on those particular beats the fastest or the quickest. Right. And an introduction of rhythm into a melody, right? <coughs> Does it change the drama? Yes, it does. Yes. Yeah. How? Well, the first one says, you know, you're flowing. It's fluid. The second one was like, it was disjointed. I felt. Yes, I'm singing staccato. Yeah. Yeah. So there was, I didn't see the continuity in the second one. Right. Right. I felt the first one was more fluid. Right. 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 That's how my brain perceives it. Right. So these are global estimations of how sound is flowing into your ears. Please notice that none of this is about frequency. It's not about whether it is Rashadja, Rishabha, Ranthara, Matnama, Hevata, Pantama, all of that. None of this is in that field. That's important to note. But it is still about some ratios which they are recognized. It is the overall Yes. And if somebody recognizes it, he would say both are both an hour. Yes, it's very much possible that a good amount of, I was only listening to her response, that she's thinking discrete, continuous shapes. Did anybody think of shapes? Did this draw a graph like that? So there are two parts to this melody. How would you describe, listen to it again, and how would you describe how these two parts are related? First part is Second part Yeah, the shape is it's a face shape. Yeah. If you move that to ga, it's the same shape of the phrase, 
which are moved from Shraddha to Mata. That's why this whole melody, like the whole loop of that melody, maintains somewhat of a sthai, as it's called in Nadu Shastra. These people who lived many, many years before us, <laughs> they had a good sense of how the mind also <coughs> perceives shapes, is, is looking at non, uh, I would say, quintessentially musical qualities. It's looking at shape, it's looking at whether incoming something is discrete, continuous, are these parts of a phrase symmetrical? And how, how does that make me feel? Right? And so, Dhwani. Dhwani in common parlance can also mean the voice that is actually voicing these phrases. But in uh, aesthetics, the shape of a phrase, let's say I sang did the shape of the phrase change to the from which is a more fluid what they call in western classical music as legatissimo to like staccato the shape of the phrase changes and that can change the way you feel about it doesn't it so the content the raw material is the same the phrase is also the same the delivery of which if i change the shape of the sound if I change the shape of the phrase, it can connotate a different meaning for you, didn't it? And this is a very, you know, this is very core, what is called the Dhwani theory, the very, very essence that with music, you, have, you can, with absolute music, which does not have lyric. See, lyric is a game changer. <laughs> but Absolute music which just operates at the level of sound and swaras and phrases and phraseologies, you can give denotative information. Jaseki, this is sa. Sa is at that pitch. Ri is at this pitch. Singa is at that pitch. That's denotative information. Physical acoustic information about this. <coughs> but it can also, when put together, give you connotative, conjure connotative meanings. In you. So who conjured these meanings? Did I conjure them or is it possible that I when I did the is it possible that I felt something different than what you did? But you engineered that experience in yourself, didn't you? Who? Conjured that meaning. Yeah. And what did you? So you did it in your own lab, in your own mind lab. What did you use? What did you use in your own lab to come up with that meaning? Experience. Yeah. So say more. <laughs> I throw that at you, what you are thinking. Hmm. Sounds a lot like. Exactly. Huh? What? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's what I was looking for. Yes, people use symbol, symbols, symbolism to actually ask, like, give meaning to like random shapes. This sounds like Usha Uttam. I'm going to do like a Lata Mangeshkar on this song. When she moves her mouth like that, she reminds me of my grandmother. <laughs> right? Symbols. People can actually, when I say symbols, you can actually, to decode shapes, to decode like phrases, and to decode styles of delivery, you're thinking, looks like Usha Mutu. Crazy lady in a sari singing Rato Pali, right? How much of that was my Disney? <laughs> <laughs> but you also contributed to it, no? Yes. So the happened between the two of you. Right. True. Yes. True. So what Kuchy, you say? Thanks is, for that. Uh, what do you say? What do you in, in cricket parlance for that uh, full toss? <laughs> <laughs> 
So yes, so we both, his perception of my Bindi and my Sari, and the fact that I was doing this very poxy sounding, you know, he put all of these non-musical things together and then said, well, that sounds very Usha also, like, right? And in this intersubjective space, that is what the Nati Shastra or even the yogic psychology talks about. The intersubjective space between two people, the communicator and the recipient, there is there is there is the process in which this cognizance is happening. There can be like great variance in the way he perceives this. You may be looking at me and thinking, well, she's sounding like I'm singing Kono If he's a Carnatic music buff, he may be thinking differently about it. So this meaning that you generated is neither coming from me alone, not coming from him alone. It's coming from this intersubjective place. I know I'm a psychologist and psychic and uh, neuro, neuroscientist and neurotic sometimes. So, <laughs> so, so I like this jargon, you know, like interpersonal variation, intersubjectivity and stuff like that. So in this intersubjective space, meaning is it's just in between. The cognizance happened in that intersubjective space. So this is also a very strong determinant of how sound is perceived. Who you are, the associations you make with music, and <coughs> the non-musical ways in which I am communicating this to you, right? And whatever is the medium, the context, and the intersubjective space that's in between. So yeah, so after I bore you with that jargon, <laughs> I'm going to add another thing to this drama, which is word, sahitya, lyrics. How many of you are like compulsive, uh, you know, when you have to do deep thinking, like, you know, a deep thing, deep learning that algorithm, you have to do deep thinking. How many of you listen to instrumental music? Only. One, two, three, four, five, six. Good. Okay. How many of you uh, resort to like the Duhari Geet when you have to like get done with some emotion? <laughs> you want to say more? Um, I resonate with both the lyrics and the music. Yeah. And sometimes I listen to foreign language uh, songs on the same note, mm -hmm. but at a lot of the minor uh, scales. Mm -hmm. So that I kind of resonate with that same frequency and that emotional state. Why should it be a foreign language thing? It's a very interesting thing you said. The reason is sometimes uh, Sahitya aspect is like professor. It can change the line of thought. Ah. And if I don't want to be influenced by some line of thought, and then I would take a foreign language book that I understand that. But that music just hits me on an emotional context and lets me put close to my thoughts and focus. So. Wow, that's pretty deep. <laughs> okay, why wouldn't you sing, uh, why would you listen to a normal Bollywood number? With a direct, you know, Main Tenu Samajha, right? Again, it's listen to that, but that's more that's the just idea in view of the scenario of the creation. Uh -huh. So I can tailor it to my own scenario, but I would better want to have my own thoughts tailoring my own scenario. Yes. Hence I would such an important point. So Greek brings this very direct and very specific context in its gamut, right? Yes. So let's say somebody is uh, howling. Um, <laughs> give me a latest Hindi song. Sasural Genda Phool. Okay, not so late. But I mean, considering I'm in the Shamshad Begum, I'm not going to Sasural Genda Phool, right? If you want to, like, you know, you may like the, the rhythmic groove underneath, you may like the overall feel. I like the you know the, the grooviness of the song, but you may not want to like literally have that word sasural thrown at you. You may not even be married. 
But you want that, you want to have that song as a conduit or a passage to your emotion, to that feel, you want to feel that feel, like the song feels the feel, right? So, in that case, you eliminate the lyric. Most often. When, when does, I mean, uh, when do people just listen to instrumental music? Are there compulsive instrumental music only listeners here? Yes, okay. When I'm starting, okay. Huh? When I'm starting, I can't even have Bollywood without it. Good. But why do you need music at all? Isn't it like cognitive interference? <coughs> How many of you feel music makes you concentrate? Music makes you concentrate. Better or not is what you're saying. One. Sometimes. 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 Okay. Help me calm down. Calm down. Okay. But it takes me completely into it. I, I, I mean, I I don't know, some people, you know, put on the music to concentrate and to do something important. But whenever I put music, I cannot do anything else. I mean, I don't know. She's like me. Okay. Yeah. And any, I, I, I saw someone hand up. Yeah. <coughs> Chronic compulsive overthinkers. Like... They usually can't deal with music because they're all their brains are like, there comes a trombone and then, you know, you're actually actively, concretely thinking about what is going on in the music like a screenplay. There are screenplay decoders. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know some people like that. Yeah. They're constantly, like if a song is on or a piece of music is on, they're constantly decoding the screenplay. Abhi dekho. Tabla gaya. Tabla came in for four beats. <laughs> now it's gone. <laughs> And then this lady is like, oh, screech, going to screech that Uthale Bhagwan or some such thing like that. You know, they're constantly manning the screenplay. And then that's such a commitment of your brain's resources for like temporarily what's coming up next and what is it that's coming up, coming up next. And that's a huge commitment of your episodic, you know, memory. Especially if you've heard the song a million times, then you exactly know ki comes and then this guy starts something. So your episodic memory and all of that is so active that it doesn't help you relax. So sometimes music can be a huge deterrent to concentration. And it, it's just not, is all of this just a function of whether there's lyric or whether the music is very dense and so on. It's also a function of personal preference, isn't it? How much of what you like. So, anybody who uses music to meditate, yeah. binaural beats. Uh -huh. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> she knows what kenda I'm putting you into. <laughs> I've tried it, it's not my thing. <laughs> binaural beats. Anybody's trying that out? And 220 hertz for uh, concentration, isn't it? What is it? Not C for. White noise. Everybody use white noise. Between chanting bowls. Huh. I try listening to groupers and so I do that whenever I want to sleep, but I don't want to sleep. Like I want to get to sleep, but I want to be awake. I listen to groupers. Very interesting. So say more about his particular use of music. So you want to go to sleep. I mean, you don't want to sleep off, but you want that feeling of yeah. so horrific feeling that. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. And why do Right. Um, maybe after a long period of silence, the singer might um, do a sa. Or a drum beat to a play. Mm. Then I wake up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, no, no. I'm not laughing because it's funny. It's it's so true. Yes. Yeah. Wait, and then? Then the vibration stops. Then I go back to sleep. <laughs> I mean, to that state of <laughs> I realized that I was going to sleep only when the vibration starts. Hmm. 
the data on the ground. Yeah. Yeah, for college, <coughs> feeling it's, yeah. So all of this asking around is to, is to give you the kinds of attention we need in everyday life. We use music as an ally, as an adjuvant. So like put us in very different kinds of attentionalities. Right? His attentionality choices. Somewhat sleepy, relaxed, but not so sleepy that you actually sleep off, right? And for some people, it is just increasing concentration, a focused attention or something. So some people, it is relaxation. <coughs> How to define relaxation? How does music relax you? Like, uh, sometimes like my whole bodily system is in like really like going up and down. Mm. So when I listen to a calm music or my favorite chants, Mm -hmm. uh, it brings to a like, you know, have an associated association with it, which is you know calm and within the okay zone of resilience. It helps me go till there, and then I can just be on my own. So it gives them an object, the outer world, to lock into and go inside. So in the Raja Yoga. <laughs> also believes that you suddenly can't be master meditator and you cannot suddenly become like, you know, you cannot be a Raji Yogi, you cannot be realized in attaining Samadhi. Sometimes you may need an object, a prop, a, a pacifier, which will lead you into that zone, but sort of catalyzes this transformation, right? So many of you use music as an object because you have two kinds of attentionalities. Please remember this when you are choosing your music. You have two kinds of attention. Your brain is capable of two kinds of attention. One is direct attention on something. And then there is this very peripheral, outer, sublime thing, which is not in your face. And for some of you, that is called uh, peripheral attentionality. And you have both on at the same time. And so all of you who use music in various degrees because there are these two fundamental capacities of the brain. And so for some, music is this mood altering thing which has to be in that peripheral zone. Acting out there, slowly learning to sleep, making you, giving you an object to actually go within, to concentrate. And for some people, it is right here. It's giving you direct suggestions on mood. Right? And so that is one concept, that's one way in which we consume music. Right? Any other feelings and thoughts? So we did, so we did why there is a great amount of interpersonal variance, right? When we, people approach music, decode music in various ways, people have various kinds of attentionality needs to which they choose various kinds of music. I would say a good 50% of your brain, this whole prefrontal cortex, this whole area is involved in vision because vision takes a lot of attention, takes a lot of um, brain, uh, RAM capacity in your brain. A good, a small amount of RAM capacity of your brain is given to your auditory sense making, your ears. And in terms of evolution, which do you think came first? The ability to hear, the ability to smell, or the ability to see? The ability to see. Ability to hear. 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 Smell. Think of an amoeba, a paramecium, which is its sensory. I think it can be. Chemotaxis. Chemotaxis. I would call it chemotaxis. Yeah, it's like chemotaxis is the biggest too. Smell. Smell. Haptics first came first. To slide on slippery surfaces. Then touch came first. Then came smell. Then came the ear. And then came your latest two eyes. So the brain has a huge commitment to your visual cortex huge and there's a small part of your brain which commits to like listening and olfactory senses and all of that and if 
you are wanting, there are two ways to lull your brain into some kind of a nice zone. You can actually go very quiet, or you can go the other end, is you try cognitive overload. That's what he does. So you are not actually attending to any of those things. You're, you're just overloading your visual sensory cortex so that your mind is able to focus on the tasks. So you are actually zoning out your peripheral attentionality and fully bringing it, bringing in direct attention into what you want to do. So that's how all these meditative tactics work also. There are various ways in which you can meditate have you tried any kind of meditation? Prabhuji is here. He's the master of it all. All kinds of inner engineering. Not the Sadhguru way, but just. <laughs> Not necessarily meditation, but kind of a guided sleep. Uh, again, there's an album by Max Richter called Sleep, mm -hmm. which guides you to eight hours of sleep. Again, mm -hmm. I tried that. It worked for first four hours, then I woke up, in a, so me and my friend did it together. And mm -hmm. after four hours, we woke up to a person going, woo -hoo. <laughs> 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 And it's supposed to walk you through the NREM and REM stream. Right. So, again, that's one thing that I've switched. Like sleep, a uh, sleep program for music. Okay, when you're asleep, who is listening? I don't know. Do you think the subconscious listen? Yeah. How do you know that? Because that's yeah. the Because you do uh, wake up with uh, with sound, right? All of a sudden, even in your dream, there is a sound or there is a real sound and you wake up. So obviously something is listening. It's like Siri, always listening. Yeah. <laughs> Good point, yes. You had something? So let's say I'm listening to you right now, but let's say the chat is there, and somewhere in the mind, it's a shark, it's just a shark. I will pick that up, even though I have the head fully conscious to hear. So I'm not actively listening to that, I'm not consciously waking up. That's all the subconscious. Yeah, in sleep, what is happening? Are your faculties asleep too? Not at all. <laughs> Sama. So who's mother. minding this? You know, the brain is asleep. Who's minding these things? Again, that evolution yeah. thing, that whatever basically, whatever sound may scare us or may mm. pose a threat to us, maybe we are more aware of that. Well, yes. Um, subconscious, what do you say? Subconscious listening. How much of it is actual listening is the question, isn't it? What do you mean by listening? To something. There's a difference between listening and hearing. Yeah. So listening is noticing something, trying to notice at least, and hearing is just taking it in and not really taking note of it. So, is any cognitive processing happening in the hearing zone? When you are listening, some cognitive processing is happening. There's some sense making, at least some compulsive sense making is happening, right? Or you're just responding to it using your palette of emotions, right? And so the, the difference between subconscious, there are subconscious parts of your brain also which are active in conscious moments, right? So when you're listening to a piece of music, when I did that, that thing, how many layers of hearing did you do and how many layers of listening did you do? We all choose one layer to latch on to, mostly. You do hear the rest of the layers. So are you able to like cognize, he, this is like, for it to be and then like, uh, I love the way in which that she's actually weaving the, the you know, the sariga is the sa is actually on the offbeat moments of the first beat and then she when she comes and sings the gaba gaba, it's actually in the three fourth part of the beat, on the fourth beat and I love the way she lands that da sariga on the beat magically. Are you able to like rhythmic at the same time 
analyze the rhythm, analyze the melody, analyze the way in which the melody and rhythm are interwoven. Are you able to do all of that interpretation at the same time? It's happening subconsciously. It's happening subconsciously. The brain is, when it sees a very complex stimulus with like, let's say, four layers of stuff happening, like a symphony. How many layers are there, or how many layers of music usually are active in a symphony? Have you all attended a symphonic concert? Yeah. And then there's harmony on top of this. Five ladies doing vocal harmonies to a single line, counterpoints, what not. When the brain encounters this 17 layers of music, like in a Ya Rahman song sometimes. Are you listening to that whole slice with like equal attentionality? Well, it depends actually. If, huh. You know, if, if I'm with my students and preparing them for something, I might listen to the, you know, to the deepest layer of that song, each beat and each uh, you know, pause and lyrics and everything. But when I'm not preparing them, I might just enjoy the music and not notice yep. at all. Has it happened? Same song, one time you noticed all the things and then yes. Yes. after a nice sip of alcohol, <laughs> have you noticed that you tend to notice more layers? Wrong question. <laughs> I know. but. You may choose not to answer it. It's, it's we'll be held in the code. It triggers the emotions. Uh, good music will always trigger emotion to person who is not musically inclined. Mm. And uh, it doesn't have to be that uh, deep level of thought process to kind of digest that music. As long as that music is yes. really good. So, this is to just sort of <coughs> drop this idea that when they are confronted with real sound, like, you know, like 17 layers, one bass, one bass guitar, and then one lady singing, and then the dhola, and the tapita, and then some synth bass, and some uh, pads out there, with, and then some open chords doing <laughs> on the back of it. <laughs> right? Much of the film music is like that. It's thick. That slice that's thrown at you is not simple. It's not like classical music. What is the average slice thickness of since you are the engineering geeks and project? Density <laughs> of an Indian classical music uh, sample of sound. Huh. Maximum five layers. Good old Tanpura. Then. Huh. Yeah. And one drama. Um, yeah, like there's a Upa Pakka Vajra, we call it, it's a man, Khanjra, something, yeah. So, if that slice is thrown at you, you may intuitively make several choices. You actually decide to listen and respond to one layer. Usually if it's a lyric, if it's a lyric in the song, most often than not, because you have this two great areas in your brain, one here called the Broca's area and another area called the Wernicke's area and because we are all speech dominant species it's very easy to make sense of speech than something that is a little more abstract as music you will choose most often than not speech, lyric you will choose that to be your more you know sense you will choose your first line of defense with that and then you will be consciously and subconsciously pushing several layers to like the subliminal perception zone. You will be pushing it down your consciousness to subconscious levels to like actually just be there in the, in the attentionality game. And then you're also actively thinking about some of these things. And then you're emotionally responding to some of these things. So, so many different kinds of processes are happening in a simple it's not a simple thing at all. <laughs> the act of listening is not a simple cognitive process at all. There's so much of the brain at play when you actually perceive 
a song as I like it, I don't like it, this is a sad song, this is a happy song, this is a song that makes me feel dull, this is a song that makes me feel enthused, this is a, you know, when you categorize, you're creating classification hierarchies with, with these things. So much of the brain's structure is at play. Do you think a donkey is likely to do the same thing that I just told you? Like, now nah, go to latch onto the lyric, not going to listen to the rhythm. Do you think it, it's its brain is capable of making those cognitive decisions? A dog. Well, we don't know. <laughs> well, we don't know. But what I'm saying is that so much of this is because so much of what you hear and what decisions you make in like, you know, listening to something is because, simply because your brain is structured in a certain way. It is not capable of multitasking at all. To answer that older question. If somebody says brain is capable of having two objects for its direct Perceptional inferences. Even an Abadhani, spatio temporally separates the thing. At every microsecond, the brain cannot have two active thoughts. Yes, exactly. Sir, please say that loudly. Please say that loudly. Exactly. It is impossible to embody two active thoughts. At one time, Eka Samaye Ubayan Anavadharana. You cannot hold in your mind two things at one moment. Because your brain is incapable of doing that, yeah, you sort of push it push this dense piece of music, you make choices and say rhythm, peripheral attention. Yeah, but then there is this issue that you are doing two things. What you would say simultaneously, which is not simultaneous in actual time, but the brain is sampling and keeping the samples in as if it is there are two arrays. Yes. You know, it's filling up here, then jumps here, fills up here, jumps here, fills up here, and yet it is keeping track of these two columns. Fantastic. Yes. And then also manages to create a global picture of that right, sound. Right. That's right. That's in first. both space and time. That is first, na. I know the, the theory of all this is the more you grasp the whole, you go to a level called sportum. Mm -hmm. so what is it called? Sportum. 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 Where the whole suddenly makes sense to you. Ah. Yeah. You don't hold anything in pieces, actually. Every time something comes, your brain is creating a hole <coughs> all the time, right? Um, yes. Right now, there's so much of information, we can't create the hole, so we create some problems otherwise. But normally, the brain is constantly trying to create a rhythmic <coughs> hole. So the moment things are in rhythm and proportion, very easily forms a total picture. Yeah. And sometimes a very abstract picture, but a picture nonetheless of the whole sound experience. And that is in fact a phenomenal capacity of the mind, of the brain. The mind, I would say. So but I know like at the same time, uh, if you look at a Tala Avadhan, Tala yeah. Abadhani, we, we had uh, invited one Tala Abadhani, like uh, they sing and they play mm -hmm. two mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. Talas in two different hands. Yeah. Yes. Right hand will be playing one Tala mm -hmm. and left hand will be uh, playing another Tala, but they have to meet at one place. Mm -hmm. Yes. But it's a simultaneous process. Mm -hmm. it yes, goes on. that's what he two said. Different talas. It's able the brain to... processes it so fast that we cannot understand. There's something called automaticity. Something called? Automaticity. So if the brain had to, poor brain had to like compute everything, like, you know, raise your hand and take a deep breath. 
and you know for simple the simple motory sensor activities to like lower order decision making to like meta level decision making you know the brain to engage in even simple everyday life has to go through has to navigate through a load of like small little big little large little small little decisions <laughs> right in performance so it develops routines automatic routines heuristics <laughs> and therefore the shortcuts their approximations they're imperfect they're imprecise but they get the job done and you're out of your way otherwise you will never be able to get out of your door <laughs> question yes. i don't know if it's the right question for this lecture but uh, we talked about interpersonal space yeah. we talked about subjectivity people reacted to the same question differently yeah. all this given I mean, what is reality <laughs> what's that <laughs> what is reality what is reality, reality. There is, what is the truth? you really look at the ending stuff there is no reality reality out there only perception there is only subjective constructs and even western psychology is coming towards that towards that yes there is no reality out there there is only a construct there is no there's no absolute reality only perception no there is there is an absolute reality which can be perceived by a mind that can be in nirvikalpa samadhi mm -hmm. Oh, that is until then it's all construct please elaborate is there, is, is there my reality and is there your reality yeah. yes yeah. that is what it is like yes. 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 even for universal things like there is your your perception of gravity there is my perception of gravity even though gravity is universal truth the ultimate that reality is seen and experienced mm -hmm. as the other exactly If you have ananda, you have some interpretation. You have ananda when you see that point. Yes. Okay. So Inside you the same point. Okay. On the back, on the on that cup shop, I'm wow. hunting on that. Correct. Demo भी होगा. मैं अपने भक्तों को कभी खाली हाथ नहीं देता. Yeah, I want in on that cup shop. Yeah. Very deep question. I couldn't hear. It's a very deep question. Yeah. I believe in outsourcing. I have to repeat the question. <laughs> repeat the question. So she is saying that there is this, there is this, what do you say, continuum of like fully subjective experiences and fully universal experiences, and then so how do you, um, and then in so many ways, there are there are experiences in the middle of this continuum. Which are quite similar to each other, right? So in so many ways, we are like leading universally accepted life. Is that right? Yes. So how do you know, explain that? This is that? one big thing, yeah. <laughs> uh, there are archetypal, there are archetypal proto images. I don't know how to translate all this into English. <laughs> there are proto images. Which are shared by all species, and then there is consciousness without any form at all, and things like that. So there are layers of this. Now, one of the reasons why you are asking this question is because you are assuming that reality is discrete. Yeah. Yeah. So what the Indian system, the Sankhya system, is saying is. There is one layer which has no form, which is common to everything in all the universes, and this then transforms into a layer which is conscious 
you know, aware, conscious is the wrong word, yeah, which is aware. This also is instantaneously aware of everything. And then there is a cloud-like layer. Then it condenses into me and you and all that. Right, so when you're talking about music and things like that, if you're really listening and you let your self go to the side, you become more and more and more in the collective space. Are you referring to the collective unconscious? The Carl Jung? See, these English words are disturbing me. I tell you, no, seriously. Yeah, yeah, I know it can't be translated. Because, no, it can't be translated yeah. because Jung came here to India. To Calcutta. Before he talked about many of these things right. and he read the Upanishads. There's a lot of, you know, pitch pitch around them. Because Jung wrote a book, which is called the Red Book where he does beautiful drawings and writes in detail about what he understood by reading this Upanishad and that Upanishad and goes into these semi, uh, I think they are called what? Uh, I'm sure you're experiencing it when you're singing that. Liminal um, spaces. Liminal spaces. <laughs> it's like half dream, half there, no? Oh. Liminal so, space. Yeah. Subliminal. Uh, subliminal. 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 You go into subliminal space. Now, when you go into subliminal spaces, there are lots of insights you get to see things in different ways. Yeah, that's there in Indian thought. But we don't have the idea of conscious, unconscious, subconscious. Right. You are part of that. You may not be conscious of it in that sense. See, the word consciousness itself is a problem. That's why I guess into a time. Yeah, you may not be aware of it because you're normally paying attention like this. But you shift the awareness and you can see it. The trick is you have to feel less anxious about the world and automatically you can turn your attention inward. Because like she's saying, not peripheral, not that. You're constantly at one level anxious and self. Right? And you've been made to feel that the world is an antagonistic place. Unless you're competitive, you can't get there. Yeah. So the whole world is giving you that rhythm of failure, you're not good enough. Every advertising you see is telling you you're not face is not white enough. You're so fair. I'm saying so my face is <laughs> not white enough. Right. So this is being constantly drilled in because it's commercially extremely. Yeah, it's commercially extremely important to keep that going. So you we we'll talk about Korea over there. Yeah. Only then you know. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so when you state that uh, there's one state where it's common to everybody. All 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 things. Uh, so if, if, just to open, just understand it better. If a person is deprived of all five senses. There's no sense of touch, no sense of hearing, can't see, can't taste, can't smell. Then what would that common reality be to a person as such? Yeah. Seriously, yes. Exactly like <laughs> this. So the question is, you have to go stage by stage, then you'll be hitting that Upanishad. So the teacher says, what? how do you go around the world and come back home? The guy says, light of the sun. He says the light of the sun goes away, what happens? The light of the moon. Right? So like that, na? So finally, you're in total darkness, what happens? Light of the self. But that's not the story, not the story. Do you think you can exist with all of your senses blocked out? Can still feel my own existence. Is there an inner music? Yes, there will be. Silence is also a form of music, is what I feel. Pardon? Yeah. I, I feel silence is also a form of music. So I can feel my own existence by blocking out everything. But mm. my existence in reality of the world could be non existent to myself again. No, you're just you're thinking too no, hard. He's, he's, he's <laughs> you're, thinking, on you're thinking into this. So just go into this, like I said, no? So let's go of each of these, 
then what happens? So it's a concept called Pratyahara. You're actually withdrawing your attentionalities from your senses, from an outer obsession into your self. Yeah, so just do it and see, no? What Kani is see, these questions, when you ask them intellectually, you will go into explanations which have a wrong basis of existence. Yeah, you're taking yourself to be some inviolable unit. Not so. And unfurling in front of it, right? So that animation of the of the physical real of the phys of the physical, the quasi physical, and the metaphysical. You know, doing a lot of jargon which is very debatable. But that is that is something to think about when you say like you know neuroscientific thing is spirituality in the body, and then all the critical thinking in the mind. Not really. So such binaries have to be done away with if you actually want to take an open-ended view of these things. So I know this is a lot of Khayali Pula than what I had planned for the Think Jam. And so do you want to just end it with a song? Yes. 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 <laughs> okay. Um, do you want to sing something together or do you want me to like prune away something? Let's see. Okay. Um, right. This is a, this is a song in the same raga as what I sang. It's one of my favorite songs. Chand <laughs> 